Good morning. Or, no, it's not morning. It was morning when I woke up. It was 3 a.m. when I woke up. Um, just so I can get a feel of who all is out here, um, can I get a show of hands of teachers? Any? All right. We've got a few teachers. How about uh, administrators, principals, central office folks? Okay. I want to open up with a um, brief little video clip. Uh, it's, it's fun. Uh, hopefully you'll laugh. Uh, because it, sometimes in our schools, it's very accurate. So uh, if you get, can play that video. You are all required to volunteer successes. My students are not understanding verse structure. We have been working on it for three days and it's making it hard to teach poetry. That is not a success. You need to mention a success from this week. There have not been any. Today is Tuesday and Monday was a holiday. See, it was not hard to find a success. Stop being so negative, and we can get more done. Does anyone have a challenge to volunteer? I have a challenge. My students are not understanding verse structure. How do you know that they don't understand? Where is your test data? I haven't given the test yet, but I know that they don't understand the material. Then how do you know that they don't understand? They told me. But if you don't give the assessment, how can you know where your students are? They told me they don't understand what I'm talking about. The students raised their hands and said we do not understand verse structure. They also presented a notarized petition and held a press conference. They compared last night's homework to translating the Bhagavad Gita into Klingon from its native Sanskrit, then translated a passage in front of me to show that it was less difficult. The homework asked them to count how many verses are in the 12 days of Christmas. There are 12. It's in the title. They assured me, as I assure you, that they do not understand verse structure. But if you don't give the assessment, how can you know where your students are? Fine. I gave a test. They scored a negative 38%. That is a low score. They definitely don't understand verse structure. Have you taught verse structure yet? Yes for three days. Which lesson are you on? The pacing calendar says you should be on lesson 12 of poetry. No, I am supposed to be on lesson 6. The unit started last week and yesterday was a holiday. But today is October 12th, so it should be lesson 12. No, the unit started on Monday, October 4th. Then there was a weekend and a holiday. So today is the sixth day of the unit. But today is October 12th. So it should be lesson 12. You are reading the date, not the lesson number. Under the date it says lesson 6. I am supposed to be on lesson 6. But today is October 12th. So it should be lesson 12. That's why the 12 is the largest number. Pacing is the most important thing, so the lesson number is the biggest number. Have you ever read a curriculum? This is how good teachers teach. You have to assess, and you have to plan, and you have to stick to the pacing so everybody is on the same page. If teachers are not teaching the same thing on the same day, how will they know what they are teaching? Even castles made of sand fall into the sea eventually. And you can't know what you're teaching if you didn't assess students' strengths and weaknesses for your differentiation when you collaboratively plan standards of teaching pedagogy. I have observed lots of classrooms the past two weeks and nobody is planning correctly. You are not planning correctly. You saw when I was in your room the kids picked up the material like it was nothing. The kids are not dumb and you keep acting like they are dumb but they just need to express themselves differently. That is why we differentiate and let students express their intelligence. You have to be flexible and ask more open-ended questions. You don't do that. You just ask them why they thought the way they do, and that's not open-ended. You need to ask open-ended questions, so they have to give you the right answer. That's assessment, and it's why we need to collaboratively plan. Do you have any idea what you were saying, or are your brain and mouth completely detached from each other? You are just randomly dropping educational-sounding words because they were on a chart you saw in your last meeting. The precious few sentences that did make any sense completely contradicted each other. And at some point I think you were quoting Jimi Hendrix. <laughs> All right, 
that's, that's good. It, it goes on for a little bit longer. <laughs> um, and, and guys, I feel like that I can, um, I can kind of be critical of my own profession. Uh, before being elected state school superintendent in Georgia, and, and we are elected like uh, the superintendent is here in Utah, um, I was a career educator. Uh, I taught high school English. I became an assistant principal, a principal, a curriculum director. Uh, I've been through the ranks. I've evaluated teachers. Um, and if there's one thing that I know, uh, <clears throat> educators can make things very difficult. And many of us uh, at times um, can talk a lot and say nothing, kind of like the principal did uh, in this particular uh, little video clip. Um, so in approaching education in Georgia, uh, you know, the, the, the conference here is about innovation, school improvement uh, and innovation. Uh, we're really looking at bottom line, what is, what's our goal? You know, let's cut through all of the, uh, the, the education ease and the bureaucracy and the jargon and let's get down to um, kids. And how are we making sure that our students are prepared to be successful when they leave us, regardless of what their path is? Because they're all going to take different paths. One thing that we know is a one-size-fits-all model doesn't work. You know, I think it was mentioned earlier about the kind of the industrial method uh, of teaching. Uh, our kids are all different, and they have different interests and different passions. One of the ways that Georgia is approaching this uh, is the um, introduction of career clusters and pathways. Some of your districts may be doing this uh, already. Uh, this may be a little unique uh, to Georgia, and I'm not sure what every state in the country does, um, but this has actually been codified in law, and it's now state statute, uh, and we have that really behind us to, to drive us and move us forward. But we are really looking at um, bringing the worlds of economic development and education together. Um, many times, uh, we as educators will uh, say we want to include business and industry, and we give a lot of lip service to that but uh, we are truly bringing business and industry together with us at a state level as a state agency to help us design career pathways that will lead to economic development uh, in the state of Georgia. Uh, the second bullet there is, is a real hard thing to swallow. Georgia in the 90s experienced tremendous economic growth, but for the last five, uh, five years we have had an unemployment rate higher than the national average. But the irony is, just in Metro Atlanta alone, we have 5,000 vacant jobs in IT that we cannot fill because of what we all know is a skills gap. What we are producing in our educational system is not matching the needs of today's economy. And our solution in closing the skills gap is career pathway, or a career pathway for all students. Um, Guys, we have to think about education differently. Uh, probably everybody in this room has an iPod, iPhone, iPad. Kids, we, we, can, we cannot see ourselves or approach education from the perspective of we're the great purveyors of knowledge. Children do not need us for information. How many of, have, how many of you have heard of Wolfram Alpha? A few of you. Our kids are using Wolfram Alpha to do their homework. It's an incredibly powerful search engine that they can go to and they can put in their calculus question for the day. Instantly, the program solves the problem, shows the child how it's solved, gives them charts and graphs. It can even write a research paper for them. So we have to think differently, and that's what we're doing with Career Pathways providing relevance. House Bill 186, uh, if you're interested in the, the legislative piece of this, that was the bill number. You can go to our state website. You can actually get the entire piece of legislation. These are the uh, respective career clusters that we are charged by uh, state law now 
to develop career pathways in each of these clusters. This is a national model. This is not necessarily unique to Georgia. Uh, many states use these career clusters. Um, but I think what we are doing is somewhat unique in how we are applying it uh, in Georgia. Uh, there are 16 uh, clusters at the national level. In Georgia, we've, act we've actually added a 17th cluster, and that's energy, because that is one of the areas where there's tremendous job growth and will be uh, for decades. When we talk about uh, renewable energy, alternative forms of energy, green energy, uh, and preparing students for the future, this is, this is a place to look. So how many of you, well, you may or may not have heard, uh, Harvard back in February released a study called uh, Pathways to Prosperity. Now this was not the, uh, in Washington, D.C., the Office of Adult uh, Vocational Education. Uh, this was Harvard University. And they did a study, and it's called Pathways to Prosperity. You can Google it, or you can read the entire study. Here are a couple of bullet points uh, from that study. By concentrating too much on classroom-based academics with four-year college as a goal, the nation's education system has failed vast numbers of students who instead need solid preparation for, requir re uh, for careers requiring less than a bachelor's degree. Uh, technology has changed our world. There are many avenues for success for our young people. And as I said at the beginning, they're all different. And they, ha and they have different passions. And one of the things that we found uh, where we were leaving kids behind via policy in Georgia was this idea of treating them all the same. And expecting and preparing to get a high school diploma in Georgia, every child has to complete the same college prep curriculum. And that's what we're trying to change. And what we have found is there are students who not, aren't necessarily interested in a four-year degree. Four-year degrees aren't bad. Mike Rowe, the guy from Dirty Jobs, he's done a little video. Uh, and he's in a um, kind of a, a construction setting. And he's talking about this very issue. And he says, you know what? If you want to pursue a four-year college degree, go for it. I wouldn't be where I am without a four-year college degree. But we can't push our students and promote that at the sake or at the expense of every other form of education preparation. He said, we've been so concentrated on getting our people into the corner office, and the camera kind of pans over to a half-built building. They said, we forgot how to build one. We still need people that can build and plumb and weld and we have tremendous opportunities for our kids in those areas, but we haven't been really teaching them the value of that. So this is not, um, uh, our career pathways are not, uh, we're working really hard to make sure it's not a career and technical education initiative, and it's not a college prep initiative. It's bringing the two worlds together. It is high academic standards with real world application and relevance. Now, if this is going to be successful, uh, we're implementing career education, K-12. Elementary school, career awareness. Middle school, career exploration. And to high school with career development. I'm going to ask you uh, another question. How many of you have kids? Have you already sent kids to college? Or you have kids in college? All right, you will understand when I say this. College is the most expensive career development program there is. I attended a private college uh, in North Georgia on scholarship because we were from a very, I was dirt poor growing up. That college costs about $47,000 a year now. When I got to school there, there was a young man there. I graduated four years later. He was still there when I graduated. It took him seven years. Guys, post-secondary education in this country is far too expensive. We can't afford any more to send kids off to college without a clue in the world of what they want to do. So that's where our career um, education program leading into the career pathways is, a go is, is an effort to not only help kids identify their passions where they can become successful, but also prepare them for the universities of Denver to make sure that they have the proper foundation of coursework. You're going to be a doctor. You're going to be a nurse. That's great. Our graduation rule right now says that you have uh, biology, physical science, 
required courses, and then a third course that's either chemistry, earth systems, or environmental science, and some other fourth course. Doesn't matter, but a fourth science course. Well, as a high school principal, I can tell you 80% of my kids, are, as seniors, are going to find the easiest science course they can take that senior year and still graduate. The career pathway for this student who's going to be a doctor or a nurse would prescribe that fourth science class to be either human anatomy and physiology or an advanced placement biology course to ensure that they have had the proper foundation of coursework before getting into college. Relevance. This is out of the Harvard study as well. We, got, we have a million kids that drop out of school in, in America every year. And they, many drop out because they struggle academically, but a, really an overwhelming number drop out because they say high school is unrelentingly boring and irrelevant. They don't make the connection. They don't see where, I mean, it is, I mean this, because they can get information in, you know, at the touch of a button now, this is, I mean, we have a generation now that I, I can't imagine you don't have a child asking you where am I, where am I ever going to use this and why do I need to know it? So relevance. Uh, anybody from Kansas? Okay. I don't see anybody. Uh, I had an opportunity uh, getting at relevance and getting at project-based instruction. I had an opportunity to visit this school in uh, little rural Kansas. Uh, very rural, very poor, 100% of their kids on free and reduced lunch. <clears throat> they were in desperate situation several years ago, had not made AYP in years. Um, and kind of as a last ditch effort, um, you know, they, anything, you know, they don't want to be shut down by the state, taken over. They became a charter school. And based on the charter, they still taught all the Kansas state standards, but they changed the way they taught. Uh, and they went to a complete project-based learning situation where they taught all of the high academic standards, but they taught it differently. I walked into the first grade classroom, and you know, one of the standards is measurement, okay? There's a ruler out on every child's desk, but guess what that ruler's measuring? An animal bone. All these kids in this part of Kansas are connected in some form or fashion to agriculture. That's what's relevant to them. That's what they understand. That's the eyes that they see through. So uh, it's not only that they were just measuring that, but the teachers were able to take that project-based lesson, you know, to extreme levels, bringing in uh, veterinarians and, and, and guest folks to, to talk about, well, the length of the bone would indicate this, and if this was a male, it, it would look like this. If it was a, so there was a lot of things that were brought in. The, the, the uh, third grade students uh, raise chickens. And uh, when the chickens are hatched in the classroom and they go out to the yard, uh, they start laying eggs. Some of their activities every day is collect, you know, they're collecting eggs. But the students are learning through the project their multiples of 12. They're learning a business. They're selling the eggs. They're problem solving because they realize when they clean the eggs, they're taking off all that natural mineral coating that, keep, that uh, preserves the egg and the shelf life. They have to solve that problem. It was an, the effect on this school. After two years, 100% of their students in their school met or exceeded state standards on the state test in mathematics. 96% plus and 98% plus exceeding uh, meeting or exceeding in reading. They are now a national model school and all they did was make instruction relevant. They taught students how what they were learning was important. I'm running out of time. Um, we have a new evaluation system. I'm going to kind of skip through these slides. Um, we began implementing this fall. We've piloted it through our Race to the Top work. Uh, it is on teacher effectiveness. We know from No Child Left Behind, uh, I know as, as a principal, that uh, when the focus was on having 100% of your uh, teachers highly qualified, guess what we find out? You could have a highly qualified teacher who's highly ineffective in the classroom. And so we are looking at, in our new evaluation system, teacher and leader effectiveness. And these are slides that we won't really get into, but there is a, a formula that is comprised of these different elements uh, that actually generates a teacher effectiveness measure and a leader effectiveness measure. 
what I want to tee up for you now in my last minute or two is our breakout session that you have coming up, and that is um, from our folks, our team from Georgia. We were one of the first states that received a waiver from No Child Left Behind. We really felt like we could do it better and differently in a more relevant way. I've never met a teacher in the state of Georgia that's afraid of accountability, but they want to be held accountable for everything that they do, not just a test score, okay? And so we really started looking at what are we doing to prepare our children to be ready for the next level. If it's elementary school, what are we doing to make sure that they're ready for middle school? If it's middle school, what are we doing to make sure they're ready for high school? In high school, what are we doing to make sure that they're ready for college and career? Because it is more than a test, okay? So what you see here is our high school index. Uh, if you want more information about these, th this is really exciting stuff. Attend this breakout session. You can get really detailed information from our team that has just really uh, worked themselves silly uh, with this index. Uh, we are creating a grade for every school in our state based on this index. It is not a letter grade. Uh, our folks were very adamant about it not being a letter grade. They wanted more prescription. You go into, yeah, you know, if you, if you go into a restaurant and you see their, their uh, health grade, you know, do you want to see a B or do you want to see an 89 or an 80? And so our schools are actually going to receive a numerical grade, 0 to 100. I don't know how I did that. Um, but what you... Um, that's okay. Uh, the last two slides were the middle school index and the elementary school index. So uh, we have, like for the, uh, the, the high school index, there are 19 different indicators on there that are measures of college and career readiness. It's not college or career, it's college and career readiness. So we have indicators for both career readiness and college readiness, and schools are receiving points on each of those indicators, and all of those indicators roll up into a score of 0 to 100, that is their score um, for their school. So uh, that will ultimately be rolled up to a district effectiveness measure or, a dis or uh, the uh, grade for the district as well. So um, out of time and don't have a whole, uh, you know, a whole lot more to, uh, to share with you on this, but this is really exciting stuff. As you know, Having been a high school teacher and a high school principal, um, this would be uh, really exciting because it is uh, bringing in a lot of other things uh, to consider what, with accountability and uh, giving you a much better, clearer picture on where your schools are. So thank you very much and enjoy the rest of your conference.